achieved. Well, quite frankly, that was a steaming pile of dog shit, to say the least. And I could be describing one of two things. In fact, I am describing two things, both my performance at UFC 209 and the main event. Uh, first and foremost, I went 4-7. and seven. They're actually correlated. They went 4-7 and seven overall. And things would have been okay had Darren Elkins not pulled off one of the biggest come-from-behind victories that we've ever seen inside the octagon because I had Bechtick paired up with a couple of fights in my gold uh, bet, and I also had him to win by decision with Yuri Alcantara. The other legs and all those bets won, so unfortunately when he got knocked out, uh, so did our chances of making some money that night. Additionally, I also had Stephen Thompson with... Uh, he, I had him paired up with uh, Cynthia Calvillo, and she was victorious. Unfortunately, Stephen Thompson did not win the main event, which was a flat-out stinker. But quite honestly, I felt the challenger did enough to win that title. I felt the judges were wrong in the way they gave it. Maybe, you know, maybe you disagree. But I felt, you know, the fight came... I, I kind of wasn't... wouldn't have been shocked had it played out the way it did. And quite honestly, with Stephen Thompson's style of stalking, stalking, and looking for openings but not actually engaging, you know, on a consistent basis, and Tyrone Woodley's, look, you know, recognizing he can't continually attack over five rounds he needs to attack in surges or else he's going to gas himself out this per outcome was not really that you know out of left field if you will i felt woodley did enough in round rounds one two and four sorry sorry thompson did enough rounds one two and four to warrant, warrant the decision as uh, they stated it should have been a 10 8 round in the fifth round because 50 seconds or however long it was should not have warranted a three-point swing because stephen thompson was winning the round up until getting knocked down and almost finished. And obviously that takedown that Woodley scored. And I, I talked about those big moments. He still had two big moments. Again, it wasn't enough in my view. But at the same time, Stephen Thompson didn't go out and take advantage of the fact that he had Woodley hesitating. He had Woodley backed up against the cage, not unloading, not engaging. He needed to pick up the tempo and engage and attack more. So really not a good main event, not a good result. The draw would have been ridiculous, and that could have very well could have been a score to draw, and I absolutely would have understood if it was scored a draw. I had it either 48-47 Thompson, or, you know, if he really wanted to go out, I would rather have seen a 47-47 than, than seen uh, Woodley walk away with a title in that scenario as the victor. Either way, it is what it is. We move on. And, you know, with the UFC, because we have so many fights in such a short period of time, we can move on quickly. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. And on this episode of the show, we're breaking down the upcoming UFC Fight Night 106 event, which will take place on March 11th. Uh, from Fortaleza, Brazil, featuring six main card fights. I will give you my predictions for all six of those main card fights on this episode of the show. I'll be breaking down for you all of my preliminary picks, uh, which there are now six, seven formerly. There were, two, were seven, now we're down to six. All of those picks will come to you at kamikazeoverdrive.net. You can also look to sign up for the bet packs. Up until the last show, I was having a fantastic 2017. Obviously, there are, we are bound to have letdowns. We will be looking to rebound this week. 15 bucks for a complete breakdown of every single fight. Parlays, props. Uh, betting analysis, fan fantasy analysis, number of betting scenarios that I've worked on and have stats posted on as well, so all worth checking out. Additionally, you can subscribe for the next five shows, and you'll probably save yourself about 20 bucks. Keep an eye out for the, uh, uh, you know, for everything else we have posted on our site, including uh, public picks. We have a couple guys who will post their, or sorry, not public picks, but the prediction panel. We have a couple guys who will post their own predictions as well, so certainly you can check that out as well. And uh, on that note, Let's get to our first prediction of the evening. We open the evening's festivities, the main card festivities, at least in the UFC's welterweight division in a rematch as Alex Cowboy Oliveira, 15 wins, 3 losses, and 1 draw, along with 2 no contests, takes on Tim the Dirty Bird Means with a record of 26 wins, 7 losses, 1 draw, and 1 no contest. That no contest from both sides stemming from their first engagement, which took place back at UFC 207 on the prelims. It was ruled a no contest after an illegal knee by Tim Means landed. Oliveira, I think he was playing it up a little bit as Means started to really have some success and hurt him. Obviously, the UFC felt they needed to rebook this fight and make it happen again to get a an actual victor. Um, you know, Charles Oliveira, in addition, or not sorry, Charles Oliveira, Alex Oliveira, in addition to that, has had some issues. He certainly you know hurt his fan base a little bit. He had the weight cutting issues in his fight with Will Brooks and how he disrespected him after that fight, even though I picked him to pull off the upset in that matchup. I was disappointed with how he handled it. 
He's been getting a bit of a reputation. Keep in mind, he is fighting at home in Brazil. They will certainly be pro Oliveira. Both guys formerly spent time at lightweight. Means it's three inches taller. He'll have a one inch uh, reach. It's actually one inch reach advantage for Oliveira, who is also the younger man by four years. Now, the first fight, it lasted just three minutes and 33 seconds. Oliveira came out using a very wide stance. He, like, he was trying to sit on the outside, sit just out of range of Tim Means, and then spring in, attack, and get out. Uh, he did go for takedowns, and Means did a good job of defending and actually getting on top uh, after the early attempt. Uh, we saw some good elbows and knees landed in close by Tim Means as well. Oliveira was having some success with his strategy of leaping in and landing those punches. Uh, he actually sent Means sprawling backwards at one point with a spinning back kick, uh, spinning turning side kick, if you will, to the midsection was landing knees and elbows in close. He actually talked pre-fight, but that's, you know, is known for his clinch attack, and Means was saying, I'm going to punish him inside, and he was having a lot of success in that position. It was a very fast-paced fight, and that was certainly a concern for Oliveira. You know, he was he did have some success with the body lock takedown, but he couldn't keep Tim Means down, and that really does two things. That takes away one of Oliveira's biggest weapons, his ability to put guys in the ground, and also it taxes his cardio, having to make those efforts over and over again to get the fight in a position he's comfortable with. You know, Means actually found some surprising success with his takedowns as well, did some damage from top position, but ultimately landed those illegal knees that brought the fight to a crashing halt. Overall, when you look at Oliver, he appeared to be having to deviate from the strategy that makes him effective, that normal uh, clinch-heavy attack with takedowns and stifling guys in the cage and shutting them down and wearing them out and working to a better position was not there, and probably it's because how dangerous Tim Means is in that position. If Oliveira, and I don't like picking guys, and I don't like backing fighters who are forced to change the game plan and forced to change or deviate from what normally makes them an effective fighter. And you, you look at Oliveira and you say, can he keep up all the movement he was using early on over three rounds? It was a high-paced three rounds if the fight goes the distance. You know, he has had issues with cardio before, even when using a strategy or game plan that he is norm, you know, used to. Means was doing much more damage when they did trade, despite giving up that knockdown. He certainly was hurting Oliveira prior to the illegal knees. Means, you know, I think he's going to force Oliver to work very hard in the clinch. He's going to do damage in that position. He's going to wear him down. And I don't, you know, if Oliver can't stop him, he's going to be in a lot of trouble. If Oliver tries to stay on the outside, once he slows down, he's going to revert back to that clinch takedown and take down a, you know, centered attack. That's not a good option for him in a fight like this. I don't think fighting in Brazil changes the outcome of this fight unless they, it's a much closer matchup and we get the judges involved. But my prediction is Tim Means to defeat Alex Oliveira by TKO. The second fight in the main card takes place in the women's bantamweight division as the former title challenger at ninth-ranked Betch, Pitbull Cohea, takes on the 13th-ranked Marion, the Belizean bruiser, Renault who comes in with a record of seven wins and two losses. Now, Betch is coming off a split decision victory over Jessica I that happened in Cleveland, I's hometown, and a lot of people were surprised that Betch got that victory. It was a very close fight. It snapped a two-fight losing streak that did include, and she's gone to back-to-back split decisions overall. For Marion Renault, she had also lost two fights in a row, including a very contestable split decision against Ashley Evan Smith. She is coming off a TKO victory over Milana Dudieva. Renault is one inch taller, she'll have a four inch reach advantage, but he is, she is six years older than Kojeda. She is 39 years old, pushing 40, which is extremely old for the lighter weight classes, and especially for the women as well. Um, this is the only the second fight in Brazil for Kojeda. Obviously, the first one was uh, her Ronda Rousey bout. For Marion Renault, she actually is fighting for the second time as well in, in the, uh, Brazil, at least under, in the UFC, where she submitted Jessica Andrade uh, via triangle in her first uh trip down there. Now, Beth can be best described as a very aggressive brawler. She likes to scrap, short-range striking, back her opponent to the cage, and just flurry her. She'll have enough pop in her hands, enough activity and connection rate to get the better of the exchanges. She throws an okay one-two, straight right, uh, connecting with I routinely in that matchup. Jessica I, not someone else's eye. Uh, and she she actually landed a decent body punch periodically when she threw it. She didn't throw it enough for my liking to kind of deviate and vary, vary, you know, vary her striking. Uh, she did lead with her right hand a couple of times and had success there. She'll throw some decent inside leg kicks that can do some damage as well. But overall, she's not a high-volume striker if you can keep her on the outside. Uh, she did benefit from a lack of aggression from Jessica I, who was kind of sitting there looking for openings but really not letting her hands go maybe for fear of get, you know that return fire. When I did attack, she had a lot of success cracking Kohea with that right hand. Uh, we saw... 
uh, Betch go to the body clinch in that fight. She doesn't have a great takedown game. She is a BJJ purple belt. She's not a huge takedown threat. She's not a huge submission threat. If the fight, if the opportunity presents itself, she will take the fight to the ground. But again, it's not something she's going to go and just bowl fighters over. She'll probably do it as a secondary aspect of her striking and look to back it up with a grappling attack. Now, for Marianne Renault, she has been working, and you can tell she's been putting in a lot of work of late to improve her boxing skills. And you can see it. She looks much quicker, much sharper with her techniques. Very active when she's striking. Lots of movement. Fast hands, and she's got some pop behind them uh she uses a very long lead left jab she'll double and triple it up she'll also come with a left hook she'll follow that jab with a straight right she throws a nice push kick down the middle gets good extension extension which really keeps her opponents on the outer edge and she'll throw some hard low kicks as well when she fought duty eight of her early on she was having a little bit of trouble getting into range she was connecting but she was really landing at the end of her strikes she wants to you know take that extra half step forward in order to make you know put some pop behind those strikes when she fought uh, ashley evan smith she actually hurt her early on with the right hand where she basically walked her down behind a flurry of strikes and landed one of the ones in the end and sent her tumbling backwards in a fight that she hurt her and then it went for a late guillotine choke in the first round and somehow lost that round that was a head scratcher uh she if she gets on the inside, she has pretty good elbows and knees in close range. She does a very good job of using head position to control her opponent. We, we heard it talked about at UFC 209. I can't remember if it was Dominic Cruz or Joe Rogan, whoever it was, using the head like a third limb to control your opponent, lift their head up, and it really makes it difficult for them to, to defend when their head's pointed straight up in the air and you're able to you know then attack the body. She'll look for use underhooks as well on the cage to really shut down and control her opponent. She can be taken down. We saw her get taken down. Uh, by duty even and other fights uh, obviously she caught the submission against uh jessica andrade off her back she's very aggressive she'll attack with arm bars and triangles that position she's not willing to just sit there and let someone sit in her garden attack she will be going for submission she'll go as we saw against ashley evan smith she attacked with the guillotine as well uh, she did an excellent job when Duty Ava started to fade when they tied up. She eventually forced herself into top position, got them out, and unloaded to eventually pull apart, uh, pull out the finish in that matchup. Now, there are certainly concerns in this fight. Both girls are known for going the distance. There's a very good chance this fight goes to decision. And that's a major concern when you're picking, when you're looking at Marion Renault fighting in Brazil against Betch Cojeda, who's known for going decisions, who's, who's eked out some close split decisions. You know, and that's the issue. In a close fight, it's hard to go against the Brazilian overall. But I like the fact that Renault fights very long with her jabs and her kicks. She'll have that reach advantage as well. I think she's going to keep Betch out of, out, of, out of range. Betch uses a lot of hooks. And if they're coming up short and not hitting, not connecting, that's a big advantage for Marion Renault. If she does close, look for Marion Renault. Use those elbows. Use those knees. Grind her out. Use her physical strength and her positioning, her sound positioning along the cage to maintain a superior spot when they do tie up. Renault, I think, should be the more active and impactful. will find some success on the mat. And my prediction is Marion Renault to defeat Betch Cojeda by decision. Don't be shocked if it was a split. And quite honestly, don't be shocked if we see a screw job here as well. But Renault by decision. Oh boy, we are two fights in. We've already picked against two Brazilians. We could very well, at least as far as logic's concerned, be 0-2 by the time we get to this matchup, at least on the main card. And this matchup will take place in the men's uh, flyweight division as the number three ranked Juicier Formiga, 19 wins and four losses, takes on the eighth ranked Ray, the Taz Mexican Devil Borg, with a current record of 10 wins and two defeats. Now, Formiga is coming off a win over Dustin Ortiz. The man is 4 and 1 in his last five fights with a split decision loss to uh, Henry Cejudo, who went on to get a title shot. Must be a little bit frustrating to find out that Wilson Hayes, a man that Formiga has recently defeated, is getting the next opportunity, and Formiga is one of the very few top-ranked fighters who has not got their crack at the UFC title. <coughs> Pardon me. Part of that could be because he is 0-3 in title eliminators, and ultimately he needs to pick up a couple of wins and follow it with that high-profile victory to get him his shot at the crown. I, would, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he wins this fight. He gets a shot in the not-too-distant future, or maybe even has to fight one more, he picks up the victory, he moves on to that opportunity. But, you know, you look at the guys he's lost against Dodson, Cejudo, and Benavides, top-level guys. For Ray Borg, he dominated Luis Smoka, Luis Smoka in his last matchup, but he missed weight, and it was the second time in his last three appearances that he missed weight. So there's a lot of pressure on uh, Borg to make weight in this fight and to be on point, because he's a guy a lot of people feel could challenge you know, couldn't be that. It might not be that far away from challenging Demetrius Johnson because he, he he offers a lot as well. 
the Brazilian one inch taller, he'll have a four inch reach advantage. He is the older man by eight years. Now looking at Formiga first, he's a world class BJJ black belt, very good on the mat overall, has a devastatingly effective back mount, six wins by Rene Kachoko overall, only one in the UFC coming over, uh, but uh, certainly if he gets in that position, he's very difficult to shuck off. Statistically, Formiga is 5-0 and when he lands at least one takedown inside the octagon, 0-3 when he's unable to land a single takedown. Uh, he had four takedowns in his wins over Wilson Hayes and Chris Car Chris Carriasso. He had just two against Zach Makovsky, but in that matchup, every time Makovsky tied up and looked to initiate a grappling exchange, Formiga scrambled to a superior position, countered every wrestling you know position that Makovsky threw at him, and ultimately got the better of the grappling exchanges and won the fight as a result. Uh, when you go to the Dustin Ortiz fight with Formiga, defeating another very sound wrestler and grappler, every time Ortiz jumped in, Formiga was right there to hook up and threaten with his takedowns, threaten with his grappling. We saw Formiga score an early takedown from the clinch position. Ortiz, you know, he, he kept getting put on his back every time he wanted to grapple. Uh, Formiga will look take for takedowns from the clinch or shoot from the outside. Uh, also look for him in the clinch position to clinch up and then start rotating to the back and drag his opponent down. It's a very difficult position when you have a guy like him, very difficult position to defend against, and that is something that he looks for. Because if you can't drag, you know, if you can't just shoot and take a guy down, if you can get on his back, it's much more difficult to, to stay vertical if you have that situation happening. Uh, one thing, uh, oh, going sorry, or Ortiz, he you know he was routinely trying to transition. And trying to get up, and we saw Formiga shutting that down with that tight body-on-body -body pressure. And the thing we saw, the play-by-play -play guys talked about in that fight, and we always see it with Formiga is he's looking to set up traps. He's trying to bait you into thinking this is a position you can scramble out of, twist your body, roll your hips, and boom, you're up. But no, he's looking to do that, and he's going to pounce on your back and go to work from his favorite premier position. Now, Dustin Ortiz did sweep him in that matchup, but he offered minimal offense from top position, and that's something it's very difficult to deal with. If you get on top, what can you do against this guy without for fear of getting you know flipped or, or getting attacked off his back, even though Formiga, definitely a better top position grapple than he is off his back. Still dangerous, though. Uh, the Brazilian also working to improve his striking, and we've seen that in the last couple of fights. His hands and his kicks look much sharper, and that's essential to his future success he throws a nice right jab followed by a straight left or he'll throw an overhand good low and body kicks he dropped wilson hayes uh with a right hand he used some counter striking to keep Hayes on the outside so we see we're seeing the evolution of formiga from just a grappler to a guy who can do more than just work on the mat cardio has been a bit of an issue for him at times even in fights where he's dominating with his grappling he will slow down a little bit but not always now for Borg, he is also a very capable, very exciting grappler. He has good takedowns. He's excellent at controlling and holding superior positions against opponents. Very good scrambler. Excellent back take as well. And he can counter out of bad spots. And we saw, we've seen him do that all through his UFC career. And the thing is, he never stops on the mat. He keeps going. Uh, against Smolka, he landed a big slam takedown, right, flowed right into side control, and from there he moved right in the mount and really dominated the round. I think he nearly got a stoppage, actually, at one point in that fight as a result of that superior position. When Smolka would attack with submissions, we would see Ray routinely defend those positions or submissions and then get a superior spot out of it and then go to work. Not a lot of ground and pound from Borg when he's attacking. He did do some damage against Smolka. He had him busted up, but he's not going to break you down with a whole pile of thunderous strikes not going to sit in your card your guard tito ortiz style and smash you uh again he was doing a, one thing at smoke i didn't like he was holding his upper body a lot for you know a lot but couldn't establish body control with his legs which would have made him been able to set up submissions it was kind of he was holding on at times and smoke was able to kind of slip his lower half away and that kept the position from being you know a, a complete wipeout but still he was winning the position borg was but it wasn't he wasn't completely holding smoke down at some points and that's certainly concerning against a guy like formiga who's so difficult to control as i mentioned borg he's you know borg's a, not a dominant striker he looks to close the distance behind a lot of what he throws he can he did have some success with clinch and knee strikes against smoke he throws a decent left hook lots of stance switches lots of movement there a lot of single strikes again he's looking to get on the inside and set up his grappling attack now, the thing with Borg, he has been taken down in fights. Justin Scoggins took him down four times. Dustin Ortiz took him down twice and had a lot of success in his debut, uh, in Borg's debut. But the thing is, you look at the way this works out, Borg, his willingness to grapple puts him in Formiga's wheelhouse. Borg is a fantastically talented grappler, very active, very capable, very creative. I don't know if he's ready to deal with what Formiga... You know, 
Additionally, Formiga has showed big improvements in his striking. He has, I think he'll have some success in this fight on his feet, but I think more importantly, he'll win the positional battle against Borg. I think Borg's willingness to scramble is going to lead him into some of those traps that I mentioned before that Formiga sets. It's going to put him in some tough spots. He's going to give up some back control. He's going to spend some time on his back. And my prediction is Juicy A. Formiga to defeat Ray Borg by decision. Moving right along, we, we jump to the UFC's lightweight division, a bout that could easily be the co-main event of the evening, is the 5th-ranked Edson Jr. Barboza, 18 wins and 4 losses, takes on the 9th-ranked Benil Dariush, with a current record of 14 wins and 2 defeats. Now, it's a major fight for both individuals. Both are looking at a future title opportunity and knowing who the champion is, if they can get that opportunity, if he ever decides to actually be a mixed martial artist and defend his title belt on multiple occasions, the winner of this could put their you know throw their hat in the ring barboza has been close on multiple occasions but he always gets within one fight just like juicy, juicy formiga gets that one fight and then loses that big marquee matchup lost to tony ferguson lost to michael johnson lost to donald Cerrone. all guys two of which have gone on the challenge of the title johnson got close as well now for barboza he's coming to this matchup back-to-back wins over pretty high profile fighters in anthony pettis and gilbert melendez matchups i correctly predicted uh dariush Rebounded nicely from his uh, upset loss to Michael Chiesa, beating James Vick and beating Rashid Magomedov in his last matchup. Now for Barboza, he'll have a one-inch height advantage, three-inch reach advantage. Dariush is the younger man by three years. Uh, and this is not Benil's first opportunity to fight in Brazil. He's already won an O in Brazil, where he defeated a very talented grappler in Carlos Diego Fajeda. Barboza, so far since coming to the UFC, he's fought four times in uh, his home country. He is three and one. Uh, that lone loss coming against Michael Johnson. Now, what we have here, traditionally, you know, traditionally speaking, we have that striker versus grappler matchup, but that is not what we're actually looking at. A lot of people might view it that way. Uh, but the big thing is, Dariush has made significant strides in his grappling, and in his last four or five fights, he has really relied heavily. So he's made significant strides in his striking. He's relied heavily on that striking attack. Um, Actually, over in his last three victories, he has landed a grand total of zero takedowns. When he fought Magomedov, he outlanded him 60-41. to 41. He was very effective with the striking and won the fight as a result. That Michael Johnson one was a bit of a question mark. I picked Darius to pull off the upset there. I expected him to have success with his grappling and his takedowns. He did not. He got outlanded 84-75, and the judges felt he won the fight. A bit of a question. It's one of those ones where you recognize, okay, I won that one. I probably might, Maybe I shouldn't have. So when I lose other ones, you kind of just roll with it. Uh, when Dariush does elect to use that ground game, he has a very suffocating top position attack. Doesn't give up position when he does get on top. When he fought Jim Miller, he took advantage of Miller's wanting to you know rotate around and was able to hold that position and do a lot of damage from top position and win that fight because of it eventually submitting him, I believe. Um, sorry, no submission. Uh, decision victory. Still, it was a ground-based decision victory. Uh, when he's standing, which we've seen out of him a lot recently, Dariush throws a paw, will paw with his right hand. He throws an overhand left, bit of a wide sweeping overhand left, almost Chuck Liddell style. He really balls it up and whips it. Uh, we did see him rock Michael Chiesa with his hands. He dropped Michael Vick, or sorry, Michael Vick, uh, James Vick uh, as well. So again, he's had a lot of success with his striking. He does a decent job when he's slipping his head off to the center line and avoiding taking shots. He's obviously evolved. He did get knocked out by Ramsey Nijem, so his chin isn't 100% perfect. He was rocked by Michael Johnson in the early aspects of that fight as well. And if he doesn't move his head, he can be tagged. And he tends to move straight back in lines as well when he's under attack. But I expect him to continue to clean that up. His kicking arsenal has also become a very important aspect of his offensive striking. Head kicks, push kick down the middle. He busted Kiesa's lead leg up with some, with some low kicks. He also attacked Darren Crookshank's body very effectively and really had him in a lot of trouble as a result. Michael Johnson fight, he was having a lot of trouble reaching him, a lot of trouble finding him, making consistent connections with his offensive uh, techniques, and was outlanded in the significant strikes margin there. He landed 75, which is pretty impressive, but he gave up uh, 84 total strikes. If he gets on the inside, look for him to use clinch, uh, clinch up with his opponent, use knee strikes. Uh, a lot of heavy shoulder pressure, head positioning, a very f- crucial part of his control as well, sh- holding guys on the wall and really shutting them down there. Now, for Edson Barboza, the guy is a nasty, nasty Muay Thai-based striker. Black belt in Taekwondo as well, so you know he has that leg dexterity to make it count. BJJ purple belt, nine wins by knockout, seven and one in fights that go the distance. And it's reaching seven and one in fights that go the distance is when he is able to unload on you like he does the impact is so significant it's hard to overlook it you have to really double up on your volume to get the better of him if you go to the judges now when he's able to set up those strikes he is lethal he is fight changing leg kicks he'll mix a lot of other kicks into the body that turning side kick that body kick where he really digs his toes into his opponent's side 
uh, that hard right low kick, you, know, you took out Pettis with it, set, taking away that base. He lands it a lot after punching combinations, which makes it that much more effective. His hands, he keeps them up. He's ready to strike. Very makes it very quick to deliver. He throws a nice left hook to the body, and he'll, he'll combo that with a right body kick as well, which, you know, it's that unconventional combination of striking that makes him difficult to defend against. Look for him to pump out that left jab. Again, very quick with the kicks. Very difficult to catch those kicks and convert them into takedowns or even defend against them. And against Anthony Pettis, he was having a lot of success landing a left hook counter everything, every time Pettis came forward. Now, we have seen Barboza in the past struggle with pressure. He gets hit 3.42 strikes per minute. So that's a lot. He did have success trying to Gilbert Melendez for the most part. His chin's a bit of an issue. He's been hurt a couple of times. He's been knocked out a couple of times. Cerrone knocked him out before submitting him. Jamie Varner knocked him out back in the day. Michael Johnson had a lot of success cracking him as well. And Johnson, the reason he was successful is he pressure boxed him. He was in his face and boom, 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 rapid succession of strikes. And Barboza really was firing back, but he couldn't break that chain of pressure coming in his direction. The cardio is a question mark and his output begins to falter a little bit. Tony Ferguson had similar success pushing him and eventually locking up a submission in a fantastic fight. You definitely need to watch if you have not seen it. For Benil Dariush to win this matchup, he needs to make it dirty. You know, clinch, chain, takedown attempts together, mix in his striking and his grappling in succession. Do not let Barboza get comfortable defensively, and do not let him unload his strikes offensively. Test that chin of the Brazilian, that might be a bit of a question mark. But the way I look at it is Benil has come very invested in his striking. He showed he could beat Rashid Magomedov with his stri- with his striking Magomedov and clinch fighting Magomedov, known for being a striker. I am very concerned for Bar- Dariush that he's going to attempt something similar here. He could still catch Barboza on the feet, who can be hit and can be hurt, but I think he's going to struggle with the speed and the impact of the offense that's coming from the Brazilian. Trading kicks with uh, Barbosa's mistake. And we have seen, I have seen Dariush sit back, his opponent lands a strike, and he looks to get it back immediately. And he, especially in his last match against Magomedov, there was a back and forth at one point where it was just boom, 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 boom. One would land, the next would land. And if you do that with Barbosa, you I think is going to use the fact that Dariush likes to stand in front, pound away at his legs, take away his base, and really beat him up. I would not be surprised to see a TKO finish. But my prediction is Edson Barboza to defeat Benil Dariush by decision. Moving right along, we are now headed to the UFC's light heavyweight division for the co-main event of the evening as the former champion of 6th ranked Mauricio Shogun, who had 24 wins and 10 losses, takes on the 12th ranked former strike force fighter Gian Vellante with a current record of 15 wins and 7 defeats. Now Shogun is back in action after winning after being out for 10 months. He's currently riding a two-fight winning streak. Vellante is looking for that big name to victory on his career to try and kind of turn things around a little bit. Uh, he has alternated wins and losses over his last five fights. He is coming off a win over a short notice replacement who was debuting. Uh, Volante, two inches taller, same reach. Volante is the younger man by four years. Now, this is the fifth straight fight for the Brazilian in Brazil for Shogun. Uh, second UFC fight for, Bra- for uh, Volante in Brazil. So he has some experience here. He did lose a decision to Fabio Maldonado in a fight he was having success with early, but gassed out, and Maldonado kind of took that matchup over. I'm of the strong understanding that those two fought, strong feeling, conviction, if you will. If those two fought under different conditions, I think Volante takes it, even though Volante's gas tank isn't that great to start with. Both actually have recent opponents' uh, victories over uh, Corey Anderson, Shogun taking it by sp- contestable split decision Volante knocked him out in a fight he was probably on his way to winning uh overall combined 29 career wins by knockout that's impressive seven losses by knockout so it's kind of live by the sword die by the sword with these two individuals Shogun four and three in the scorecards Volante three and four in the scorecards no neither man even though they will wrestle and neither man a huge submission numbers now, for Shogun, he is a Muay Thai striker, that old shoot box style striker, but his chin has been a bit of an issue of late, as the numbers would suggest, his cardio as well, but he's fighting in Brazil, so that's certainly a scenario that is in his favor. Now, what Shogun does well, he's, he's known for his kicks. He didn't look like in his last matchup against uh, Corey Anderson, he was turning the kicks over the way he has in the past. He's had knee surgeries, he's had a lot of issues, he's getting older. He's been through war, so the question is, can he continue to do that? It looked like as the fight progressed, he loosened up and was getting a little more stank, if you will, on those strikes. And overall, it did the accumulation of strikes did appear to be hurting Anderson as the fight progressed. He seemed to be reacting more and more to those strikes landed. But ultimately, it's forcing him, his opponent, to be concerned with those low kicks coming in. And, you know, that tendency to want to reach down and defend against them opens you up, opens your chin up, opens your head up to take damage. So that's big. Shogun throws a big right hook. He'll throw a straight right as well. He'll throw an uppercut. He'll counter with his right. A lot of his offense comes from the right side. Not all of it, 
but predominantly he is a right-handed fighter, a right side fighter with his big with his big weapons. He does throw a little bit from the left side, but again, it's not nearly as much. Reese, which where is where he'll get that left hand mixed in there as well. He did hurt Corey Anderson late with the left hand after throw, throwing his right initially. At the end of the first round, at the end of the second round, he goes another knockdown, another good shot for Shogun that really turned around in his favor. He landed with his right hand, put him on the mat as well. He can be dangerous overall when he sits on his on his punches and exchanges and throws multiple punches in succession. I wouldn't call them combinations at this point, more just flurries. That's why I like to describe them. Uh, on the other side of things, I didn't like the way he was getting cracked with Anderson. Corey Anderson was having some success pushing forward and landing strikes in succession and was also, you know, doing well with some low kicks in that fight when he did opt to throw them. We have seen Shogun use takedowns in the past. It could be an option against Gian Vellante here if Vellante is starting to slow down and Shogun wants to mix it up, put him on his back and really cement a round. Now, for Gian Vellante, you know, he was looking good. You go back to the Tom Lawler matchup, he was looking very good against Tom Lawler. He was landing those brutal leg kicks, throwing combinations. He looked, he was active, he was sharp, and then he got himself knocked out. That's probably one of his best recent performances, or at least complete performances prior to the finish. He throws a pretty good left jab, right low kicks. He'll go high with his kicks as well, which, you know, it, it's, he's a pretty athletic guy, so that's not surprising he can pull that off. He throws a big right hand overall. He obliterated the lead leg of Corey Anderson with low kicks, eventually knocking him out. He hurt Anderson with a brutal right hand at the end of the third round. Uh, same thing with Anthony Parash when he put him down, it was with the right hand, and he'll mix in an uppercut from that side as well. Uh... Against Savarov, the guy he fought in his last matchup, he was getting the better of it, landing a good left jab, a straight right combination, but he was still getting tagged with shots, uh, and he was slowing down. We saw him, cut, similar against Corey Anderson, he was winning the fight, but he was slowing down, and that's certainly a concern. He was covering up against Anderson and against Savarov at times. When they would blitz him, he was being forced to just basically shell up and hope to hold out the storm and get through it, and then boom, return fire. But he does have a drop-off, especially in volume, in a fight that goes into that second half. He will slow down, and that's crucial to how this fight plays out. You know, he was actually knocked down in that matchup against, again, he was lighting Savarov up, but he got knocked down with the right hand. He was clearly tired at the end of the first round and pushing, he, he basically, he was pushing and trying to just kind of push Savarov back and create separation, and then he just attacked. But again, that, it's exhaustive, but that's what he was doing to try and get that distance and get him off of him. Uh, Shogun's chin and cardio aren't what they used to be by any stretch of the imagination, but I would over Gian Vellante. I think Shogun has the ability to be more dangerous as the fight progresses, carries his power his power a little bit deeper into matchups, and I would say his cardio, you know, his his chin is better. He got knocked out by Dan Henderson. You know, it's not like you know, he's been knocked out a couple of times, but it's not like he's getting knocked out by every single guy he faces. You know, Shogun, he's fighting at home. That's certainly going to help. Vellante struggled the last time he was in Brazil, especially if it was warm. It was a hot environment, hot arena, and that hurt, certainly hurt him. I don't know if that'll be the issue here as well, but Volante, maybe it's the atmosphere overwhelms him a little bit. I think Gian, Gian, Volante, Gian Volante needs that early stoppage. He won't win a decision with a lack of volume unless he spends a lot of time on top position and just dominates Shogun in striking exchanges. I, but I think he'll be too tired late to really get the better of it. And I think Shogun's actually going to catch him with the right hand during a flurry. And my prediction is Shogun Hua to defeat Gian Volante by TKO. The main event is of the evening takes place in the UFC's middleweight division, featuring the former UFC champion and ninth-ranked middleweight uh, Vitor, the phenom Vitor Belfort, with a current record of 25 wins and 12 losses. He's taking on the 10th ranked Ultimate Fighter winner, Kelvin Gastelum, former welterweight Kelvin Gastelum, with a current record of 14 wins and 2 losses. Gastelum, obviously, with his winner, Tim Kennedy, an upset I predicted, vaulting himself into the rankings. Now, Gastelum is looking to jump up into that upper echelon. This is the type of win Belfort formerly in that upper echelon. He's taken, obviously, a step back. Gastelum beats him. It puts him in the mix with guys like Jacare, you know, Robert Whitaker, even Yoel Romero. That'd be an interesting fight, even though Romero is such a specimen of a fighter. You know, Vitor is looking to hold on to his top 10 position. He knows the loss here that he takes a big hit, and he's been talking about retirement. Then he talks about being in a better spot than he's ever been, which, again, that's a lot of guys will say that at the end of their careers, trying to motivate themselves and get themselves in a better spot mentally. You know, what it comes down to is how you perform in the cage, not what you say before, during, whatever. But uh, Gaslam comes in this matchup having won back-to-back -back fights, formerly defeating or defeating defeating former welterweight champion Johnny Hendricks in the welterweight division. He's now middleweight as well. Uh, Tim also defeating Tim Kennedy, retiring Tim Kennedy uh, in his last matchup. Belfort has lost back-to-back -back bouts overall. Now physically, because Gaslam is more physically suited to be a welterweight. Belfort is three inches taller. He'll have a three-inch reach advantage, but Calvin is the younger man by a, an astonishing 14 years. 
Now, Vitor, we all know what he's about. There's no secret. He has massive power in his hands, 18 wins by knockout. He attacks in short, quick bursts. He relies on his hand speed to really get on the inside, do damage, and either finish the fight or hurt his opponent and lead to something else. During his recent resurgence that led to a title shot and made him, a lot of people talk about how dangerous he was, he was relying heavily on his kicking game to do a lot of damage with those kicks, knocking out guys like Michael Bisbing and Luke Rocco with head, with head kicks. Very impressive in those fights. You know, his style, though, overall is not built to go deep into matchups. His cardio is a major question mark. You know, he has four and five decisions overall. He Again, he's he doesn't have a lot of volume. He's looking for quality over quantity. Not, you know, not a ton of volume. He's not going to step in and overwhelm guys with a constant flow of offense. He's looking to unload. He's looking to finish. He's got two or three, maybe four bursts in him at best, maybe less than that at this point in his career, to get his opponent out of there. When he fought Musasi, he had a lot of success, trouble getting backed up to the cage by Musasi, which took away his ability to really tr- jump forward and attack. Limited his movement, allowed Gigard to really tee off on him. He was firing back in the And a lot of people, could he catch Kelvin Gastelum like that? Could he you know, catch him coming forward? Absolutely. We saw Kelvin rocked in the Rick uh, Story matchup. You know, he, There's been issues there as well, but certainly Vitor has the power if he touches anyone's chin to finish them. Uh, one thing with Vitor, his recent defeats have come on the mat. TKO losses, submission losses to guys like Musasi, Jacare Souza. He gets overwhelmed. He gets tired. He gets, reverts to going to a back position. Chris Weidman as well. And they eventually find the ability to put him away once they get on the ground. He is dangerous off his back, but again, exhaustion takes over. and He doesn't really have the technique. We saw him nearly, catch John, nearly finish John Jones with an arm bar that was damn close. But again, he's still vulnerable because ultimately for Gastelum, when he's striking, he does his best work in close range, pushing forward behind punches and really using a lot of pressure and unloading, kind of similar to Cain Velasquez. That's why a lot of people touted him as like a mini Cain Velasquez. He's shown himself to be very light on his feet in recent appearances, slamming in good leg kicks. He'll attack the inside leg, really taking away his opponent's base. He'll throw some nice body kicks. Again, he needs to be careful, though. If he throws those kicks into Vitor, Vitor doesn't come with his hands and counter-strike and knock him the fuck out. Uh, Gaslam's hands, though, have looked, I've been very impressed with the strides he has made of late. Pawing with that jab with on the right side and, uh, you know, really trying to break guys up by pawing at them and then snapping a jab out. He'll fire a straight left as well or a left hook. He'll come over the top with an overhand left. He can, he can do, he mixes things up nicely and can do a lot of damage. Uh, he does a good job with his head movement and overall his, his body movement, body motion of making his opponent swing and miss and then landing his own strikes when they're kind of trying to retract their limbs. When he fought Kennedy, which was a very back-and-forth, grueling matchup, he put a lot of pressure on Tim Kennedy. He had to ward off a lot of clinch and grappling exchanges, but ultimately he started getting the better of them as Kennedy slowed down. And he made Kennedy carry his weight, which is something if he can do that to Vitor Belfort, it's going to have a similar effect, even more so maybe, and really break him down. He can work a wrestling attack. He's also had some issues with guys who will go offensive with their wrestling against him. That's not something Vitor Belfort's going to do. But, again, if they hit the mat, Gastelum has to be very concerned with what Vitor has to offer off his back, at least in the first round. After that, he's probably okay. Vitor, ultimately, Vitor is incredibly dangerous. He's going to be pumped up to be fighting in front of his, you know, the Brazilian crowd. It's going to be a very raucous pro Belfort atmosphere. He only needs one strike to land to finish this fight, but it, it's, I don't think it's going to be enough. In Brazil, you know... The pressure factor, again, the pressure factor could get to Gastelum, but again, I think he's a pretty cool customer under, in the right circumstances. As long as everything goes well, the weight cut and everything else, I think he'll be fine. Gastelum has to be careful early on. Chip away at Belfort, stay on the outside, make him swing and miss. You know, get that shoulder against him and get that head positioning along. The, Gastelum, I think he's going to be too quick. He's going to be too active. He's going to mix together some, rest, some wrestling and some striking when the, when it, you know, when in the, the proper situations. Eventually, it's going to wear Vitor down. And my prediction is Kelvin Gastelum to defeat Vitor Belfort by knockout. Probably TKO. So those are my six main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 106. All of my preliminary picks will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. So all the bet packs, if you're interested in purchasing, check that out. You can always email me, follow me on Twitter, talk to me there at KO underscore predictions. As well, follow the Facebook group. I'm always, I'm usually available to, you know, if you need some dialogue, you want to talk to me about something, ask me a question about something I posted or about something I didn't post that you're curious about. I'm always there. You know, my opinion is to get everyone else's. If you feel you value it, by all means, if you don't, you don't have to. Um... What else do I want to say? Yeah, I apologize for this video being a little bit late. It took me a little bit extra time to get in here. I want to do a little extra research to hopefully try and help us with a rebound here. Uh, I was kind of thankful. As much as 13 fights is a lot of fights to predict, it was kind of fun when one fight got knocked off. Even though I was looking forward to the matchup, it gives me one less fight to have to worry about. I can put a little more effort into all six of my other fights. Either way, thanks for tuning in, guys, and uh, we'll see you right back here for the next one, which is I think UFC Fight Night 107. Take care.